chapter called The Guardians of the Glory. And I would like to make a couple of statements that might have been misconstrued or perhaps taken in the wrong sense or the wrong frame. And so I want to make sure that I clear them up before we finish this Bible study. Um, first of all, um, anything that's sin is sin. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when I talk about uh, pride, vanity, and, and many of the things that were being discussed in this particular Bible study, um, I was talking about the intent in which the things we're doing were doing. Okay? Does everybody remember those wordings being used? Amen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't care what the intent is, if whatever it is you would put your hand to do is sin, having a, a good intention for sin is still sin, yep. all right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just want to clarify that, uh, you know, there are certain things the Bible expressly talks about, makeup is sin. Uh, I mean, we, we talked about some of these things, but I want to make sure that it's, it's clear. Uh, and, and there may be things that you are doing that I may have mentioned uh, in the lesson that you're not vain about. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I haven't yet got to in this lesson is that God expects us to look nice. He doesn't expect us to look ill-kept and sloppy or uh, disheveled or anything like that. And so I hate to have um, had to stop where I had to stop last week uh, and given some of the wrong impressions perhaps to the congregation at the time. But one of the things that we looked at and where we started off from in this respect was Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, um, we were looking at the passages of Scripture that talked about um, the, the war that rages between the spirit realm and, and this uh, discussions and matters of holiness. Holiness is not one of the options that comes with whichever church you attend. Uh, holiness Amen. is a command from That's God. Right. Amen. Uh, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Amen. The Bible tells us that we should be holy because He is holy. Right. Some of the things that we are looking at in these particular passages and chapters that we're looking at are in reflection of holiness. And in fact, the, the book that we are covering right now is called Power Before the Throne, and it is because there is an opportunity through the items of holiness to truly have power before the throne. Amen. And so this war that, that wages, one of the things that we need to understand is it wages between this world that we live in and the spiritual realm in which we are being called to. Okay? He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. separate. Oh, yes. Okay? What was he saying to come out from among was it your parents? Was it the home that you live in, the job sin. that you have? He's calling us out of a world of carnality, a world of sin. And he wants us to be separate by calling us into a world of spirituality. Uh, these two, the Bible describes, are enmity against each other. And so uh, the necessity for us to understand is, is not that there's some war we can't figure out. We can't. It's waging, and we're just waiting to see who wins. But holiness has a great part in this war, and it is waged on an individualized basis. Okay, because we're either going to live for carnality and sin, or we're going to live for the Lord, which includes living a holy life. Right. All right? And so some of the things that we were talking about, or the main thing, I guess, that we were talking about, is in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17, what was it that caused... Uh, Lucifer to fall in the beginning. Right. Okay? He was prideful about something in particular. His beauty, his beauty right? Beauty. Okay? And he became vain about his beauty. His beauty caused him to throw wisdom out the door. Isn't that right? Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us that he corrupted his wisdom because of the reason of his brightness, right? Yep. Okay, and because of that, he began to sow seeds within his life that were seeds of what? Rebellion. Rebellion. 
And so these seeds of rebellion began to grow within him, and it lifted him to a place where he thought he could be equal to or even overtake God, right? Mm -hmm. And so he began to wage a war, and because of that, a third of the angels and he were cast out of the heavenly places, correct? Amen. Okay, and now the same spirit that caused him to rebel and to allow pride and vanity to corrupt his wisdom is something that we still deal with today. Amen. And so that was the essence of the lesson that we're talking about is how pride and vanity infect us and begin to override wisdom and the teachings of the scripture. All right? And so uh, we had talked through quite a bit of the lesson and given several examples. And so uh, we stopped right before this particular passage, even though we talked about it. I thought it would be a great point to launch again uh, from today. And it's 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. The scripture says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so it comes down to, and I know that I had a couple of discussions after Bible study with uh, different people in relation to the topic that we were covering. And, and in relation to that, it comes down to who do you love more? Right. Or what do you love more? Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are certain things that maybe we've always done. Or there are certain things that other people that we like, whether they're a part of a church that, that is in truth or, or partially in truth, or maybe they're just part of the world and we're in a group with them or a club with them or go to school with them, whatever the case is, we see somebody else doing something and because we see them doing it and the way that they talk about it, it's something that piques our interest and so we become very interested in doing those same things. And so really the essence becomes who or what do we love more? Do we love God and the things of God more than we love the world and the things of the world? Right. Now, see, if I were to ask, I'm sure that there's not a single person in this place or, or, or around us that would say they love the world more than they love God. Right. But remember, love is not dictated by the words of our mouth. Right. Correct? Right. For there would be a, never a husband fail a wife. There would never be a, a, a child that failed their parents because we're quick to say, I love you, right? Right. Yep. Not a kid in the place. So the... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Everybody loves everybody, right? Yeah. All right. It's not the words of our mouth that dictate or measure our magnitude of love, but rather it's the actions that we do that measure or dictate how much we love something or whether we love something more than something else. All right? And so when we begin to look at this, the Lord is walking throughout his church and he's looking into the hearts of men and women and children and he is looking for truth. He's looking for purity. He's looking for love that is governed in his direction. One of the tests that he runs upon our hearts to gauge our love for him is the test of holiness. Okay? And so the question then becomes, how much do we really love him? If the pathway that we are choosing to walk or the one that we're being steered to by a friend or a neighbor or a spouse or uh, just whatever, you know, we're, whoever is influencing our pathways, if that pathway begins to look suspiciously broad, mm -hmm. we probably ought to stop and reflect upon the direction we're heading because if you'll remember, the Bible says that broad is the way and wide is the gate 
that leadeth unto destruction. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But narrow is the way. Right? Right. And straight is the gate mm -hmm. that leadeth to life everlasting. Yeah. And so if the pathway we're traveling on is opening up and opening up and opening up, it's possible that we begin to uh, bring something into ourselves or allow something to infect us to the point where we have become vain or perhaps prideful and, and we've allowed wisdom to be corrupted. Because remember, when you allow these things to begin to infect your life, Conventional wisdom is not making sense to you anymore. The things you're doing begin to make sense to you. You have completely begun to think about it, and you begin to, to fashion ways in which it all fits into the greater picture. I'm still living for God. I'm still going to make heaven my home. And this is why all this fits together. And this is why it makes sense. And this is why it's okay to do it. Okay? Remember, wisdom gets corrupted. That's what happened to Lucifer. That's what happens to men and women all throughout eternity is wisdom becomes corrupted. And until that bright light begins to shine in our pathway again and illuminate the areas of our life where we have gone astray and followed that broad way that so many people are walking down. I mean, literally, if you can look at something in your life and say, the reason that I like this or the reason I want this or the reason I'm doing this is because of so-and-so, right. you really ought to check. Because that's pride stepping up and saying, I want to be just like. Right. Okay, Whether it's a sports star, an actor, an actress, your neighbor, your best friend, I want one because they've got one. We talked about that briefly last week, and, and I just want to reiterate it here because now we're loving the wrong thing, right? And we're willing to sacrifice the things of God for the love of that thing. So what means more to you? Your appearance or your relationship with God? Now as I, as I state that, let me give you that flip side of the coin. Now, I have been to churches where for whatever reason, the, they, they have been taught and felt like they had to live slovenly, their hair had to be looked, you know, they couldn't be done. It had to be down and in and, and, and most cases look unkempt. And, and I'm telling you, that is not what the reflection of God looks like. All right? All right? Uh, we are ambassadors of Christ. Right. And if you're an ambassador of Christ, then you're going to look like Christ. And just because we're saying you shouldn't value your appearance or, or, or love your appearance more than you love God, it doesn't mean that we should be unkept, we should be ill-smelling, we should be sloppy. Um, what are some other words? You know, that does not equal holiness. Right. Let's just put it that way, okay? The Bible describes the beauty of holiness. Right, right. Okay? You put a holy person, whether it be a male or a female in a room, and obviously holy women stand out more in the world that we live in today than do holy men, okay? Because you can have a, a CEO in a company and he can, you know, for instance, be dressed holy or look the part of a holy person. Right. Okay? But the truth is you can put a holy man in the midst of even CEOs of companies and that holy man is going to stick out because there is something about a beauty that is generated and propels itself out from holiness. Right. Amen. True holiness. Holiness that is, that is loved within the heart. Okay? Not holiness Amen. that is a set of rules that I'm adhering to. Right. Because that's not holiness on the inside. That's, right. that's not true holiness. That's right. Holiness is reflected on the outside, but it has its beginnings and it has its that's place right. within the hearts of men and women. You can know I cannot do this, I should not do this, I won't go here, I shouldn't say these things, and I'm going to abide by these rules because that's holiness. That's not holiness. That's right. Okay? That is the principles of holiness being reflected in the life that we're living today. But holiness is an attitude on the inside. Holiness Amen. is the love for the things of God That's working right. on the outside from the inside. That's right. 
And that's why you have so many uh, churches that are having troubles with holiness. There, there are churches even around our area here that are uh, apostolic in word only. They're not apostolic in their nature. And, and they claim holiness. They have holiness in name only. Right. And they hand out sheets full of rules and guidelines. And the people get home and they can't wait to get out of the rules and do something beyond the rules or against the rules. And you, children can't wait to get out of homes that they've grown up in where they've had these rules applied to them. Why? Because there's not real holiness in the homes or in the children's hearts. Or it's just, it's a shame that if our concept of holiness is something that is in thought only or in action only, but holiness has its beginnings on the inside. We are ambassadors of Christ, epistles as the scripture defines us, known and read of all men. Literally, we should be the mirror showing the reflection of God in our lives. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see Christ in me. Amen. The hope of glory. Does that sound vaguely familiar to you from the scripture? That should be the desire of each and every one of us is that when somebody's looking at you, they're not drawn to the looks that you have, but they're drawn to the image of Christ that is being reflected through the beauty of your holiness. Mm -hmm. Psalm 50 verse 2 says, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Right. The church literally is the perfection of beauty in this sinful world. We talked about it uh, in a couple of lessons past. What does the wearing of makeup do to the face? But it has its lasting effects on it, oh, and it makes us it, it makes us to be aged. It makes us to look older than we really are. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And so, what does what does it do to beauty? Really, the things of this world we don't understand how or why, perhaps, but we cover up the beauty that God has created and what God wants to become the beauty of holiness in our lives. We cover it up with worldly, sinful nature. And then we wonder why it ages us or destroys and breaks down that which God has created us to be. And so as you look, Proverbs 31 is probably one of the most familiar passages of Scripture to ladies uh, in and around our, our uh, churches and our fellowship. Why? Because it speaks of the virtuous woman. Correct? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad everybody you know, echoed that they knew that that's what that was. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the virtuous woman. It says a lot of things about this virtuous woman. But let me just draw your attention to one thing in that particular passage of scripture. It says that the virtuous woman or the godly woman is well dressed. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't say that she's uh, prideful about the way she's dressed. It doesn't say that she's focused on the way she's dressed. But remember, her husband is known in the city because of her. Right. And part of that has to do with the reflection that she is yielding to those that are around her. Sin comes in, not because we want to look nice, but rather when we want to disobey the order of law that God has instituted within the kingdom to enhance our outer appearance in ways that are contrary to the teachings of the word of God. Okay? And we talked about some of these things. Right. I mean, if you're dyeing your hair, why? It has, I mean, you're not going to get into places you couldn't get into before because you dyed your hair, Right. Your only reason to do that would be because you're vain about the color of your hair. Or because you want to have different colored hair every other day of the week. Whatever the case may be. Right? Mm -hmm. So many of the things that people do within our culture today. Remember we, 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 we loosely throw around that word culture. And, and you know we live in such a, 
a, a multiplicity of cultures pulled together within the United States of America. And it's very dangerous when we start using culture as the reason why we do things. God doesn't call us to be Christians within our culture. He calls us out of our culture into a godly culture. Right. The kingdom has its own culture. You're the same race, you're the same sex, you're the, unfortunately sometimes the same economic class that you're in, but he calls you out of a culture of worldliness. Right. Regardless of where that culture had its base roots, it's still a culture of worldliness. And to, to, to try to adhere to the same things in our culture, our culture is based in a worldly thing that is, is consistently trying to draw us and attract us to do things that are ungodly, that are sinful, even in the basic nature of what they are. We're to dress in a manner that becometh or is suitable and attractive for men and women who are professing to be godly creatures. All right? Mm -hmm. Let's look again at Ezekiel 28. This is where we started from. Let's... Let's draw it back to ourselves here in Ezekiel 28. Let's look at verses 14 and 16 again. It says this, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Remember, Lucifer's main responsibility was as the covering cherub. He was to do what? As the covering cherub, he was to do what? Protect the glory of God. He was to guard the glory of God. That was his main responsibility. When he was cast out, he lost his covering. And God, in his amazing and very poetic nature, he delegated Lucifer's lost estate, that, that covering, to the women within the truth right. of God's church. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 10 and 15, as we've been talking about, throughout several of the lessons, for this cause of the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Mm -hmm. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory, glory to, her, to her, for her hair is given her for glory a covering. Her. This issue is no longer just a small, tiny little holiness issue that you may or may not agree with. Now it has gigantic proportions in the life of men and women within the kingdom of God. Why? Because... This has to do with the lost estate of Lucifer being handed unto the woman of our, our, our church. All right? Mm -hmm. The enemy tempts women over and over and over to tamper with this covering. Trim it. Cut it. Dye it. Shave it. You know, add stuff to it. Whatever he can do to tempt the woman to do something with that that is ungodly. Over and over and over again. Because it's, it, it, it is the very symbol of everything that he lost when he was cast out. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> if you lose something because somebody took it away from you and gave it to somebody else, you may not necessarily ever think that you're going to get it back. But the one thing you want more than anything is for the person it was given to not to have it either. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And you can see this play out over and over again with children. Parent walks in, the two kids are fighting, it's taken from one and it's given to another. Mm -hmm. Well now that one is mad and they jump up and down and they're going to scream and they're going to do whatever they can in their power to call, if I can't play with it, you're not going to play with it either. Yeah, sometimes I don't break it. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And, and it's that same way in Lucifer tempts and tempts and tempts and tempts. Whatever avenue, whatever way, just trim a little bit, rip a little bit out. Whatever you can do, however you want to do it, let's just change it so that it's not the glory any longer. Because remember, her hair is given her for a covering. He was the covering cherub whose purpose was to protect or guard the glory of God. Mm -hmm. When a woman falls out of church, decides that she's going to live for herself, or falls in love with the things of this world, one of the first things that that woman faces in reality is this desire to change her appearance. And oftentimes one of the very first things that she will change in her appearance is the thing that is most drastic when people look at you. And that is the hair. Because if the hair has been long, and the hair has been godly in its nature, and the way that it has been kept, the most uh, d demonstrative way that you can strike people immediately is by cutting the hair. So... Uh, one of the sources of that enmity between carnality and the spiritual that we were talking about um, would be between that of the woman and the serpent. Of course, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 tells us about the beginnings of this rivalry, I guess you might say, or this war that wages between Satan and the woman. Isn't that correct? Yes. Amen. What does Genesis 3 and 15 say? Is everybody just echoing? Okay, yeah, you got to be the pastor, so you got to be right. You must know what you're talking about. you got the book. We're just sitting here. What does Genesis 3 and 15 say? Somebody. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head. Okay, what, what stipulated or what caused this enmity to be put in place? Anybody? What? What? Anybody? What? What? What, what, what caused this enmity to be put in place between the woman and Satan? When they ate from the tree. She because he used the things of this world mm -hmm. to draw her away from the place of holiness and purity that she had been placed in. Does that sound familiar? Amen. You just go back to what Satan said. Oh, you want to be like the gods. You want to be, have power. You want all, he began to throw out to her all the things she could have at her fingertips. It was good to the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It was, it was good to all these things, and she did take and she did eat, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And it was sin. Mm -hmm. It was sin. The drawing away from, from him, uh, trying to lure her in, and when she fell prey to that, God immediately separated the two and he put enmity between them. And that same war rages on and on and on today. And women today now have the opportunity to be the guardians of the glory. The position that he fulfilled in himself, he did not attack the man head on. He came at the man through the woman. We'll talk more about that as we continue in this lesson, um, remember, a woman's hair signals to the spirit world whether she's in rebellion or submission. We've talked about that, correct? Right. Because it is the one thing that the angels understand. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. Because they've never experienced the Holy Ghost. Right. Okay? They don't understand obedience to a lot of the laws that we have because they don't know the laws that we have. They've never experienced those things. But one thing they do understand is rebellion. Lack of submission they understand. Because that, my friends, caused a great, great dissension amongst the angels. 
to where a third lost their first estate. Right. Correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, it defines whether she is in the correct place in God's order. And just by the angels immediately looking at her, they understand where she is and what she loves more than anything. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two types of angels. Two types of angels. There are the angels of the Lord, the ones that you hope are pleased by your covering. And then there are the angels of darkness or the angels of Lucifer mm -hmm. who are attempting to draw you away from that place mm -hmm. where you are in submission to the plan of God and the authority of God. Okay? And as we look at this guardian of glory concept, I want to draw your attention to at least two or three other areas in which you need to be cognizant as ladies, not just the women of our world, but as ladies within the truth, how important the guardians of glory really is, not just to yourself or to your children, but to your household, mm -hmm. to your church. To the truth of God's word within your community. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, when we start talking about uh, the covering, the glory, um, the things that we said were uh, taken away from Lucifer and were given unto the women uh, of our church heritage, uh, we, only other time in the scripture we see these things kind of talked about and compiled together was as we discussed briefly last week, the Ark of the Covenant. If you look at it, it, it talks about these three, the covering, the angels, and the glory coming together at the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the mercy seat covered the testimony, which was the law. The cherubim or the angels were hanging over that mercy seat as a covering mm -hmm. assigned to guard the glory. And, of course, then the glory came down and sat and dwelt amongst the cherubims that covered and protected the glory and sat on the mercy seat. And so as you think of it in this, this concept, okay, I, I want to draw your attention to an important factor that maybe we wouldn't put two and two together and get four necessarily if I didn't bring it out in this particular way. If ever the covering of the mercy seat was removed from the ark, the angels were removed with it. Okay, by the nature of how it was, the angels were removed with it. They were attached to the covering. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the glory, mercy, and presence of God were removed as well, leaving only the bare naked law. What would be missing if we had only the bare naked law? Um, what was the name of the seat called? Mercy. mercy. mercy seat. We would have no mercy. Now, could they live by the law? No. No one could live by the law. Mercies, mercies, mercies had to be doled out. His mercies are new. Every day. Every day. Every day. Why? Because we have an opportunity to live under the covering and protection, the divine protection of God. Isn't that right? Amen. And so because of that, we need to understand that when we forfeit the covering of God, we have forfeited the divine protection of God, and we are going to be judged by the bare naked law, and there's no mercy there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. Judgment may not be expedient. Right. It may not happen right at this moment when divine protection leaves. But you rest assured. You rest assured you'll be judged by the entirety of the law. When there is no mercy. The token of our New Testament salvation is the blood that is applied through baptism in Jesus' name. Without the covering of the blood, we are exposed to the bare naked law right. without mercy. The woman's hair is a type and a shadow of the covering that Jesus Christ provided for his church. That's why he relates the relationship of Christ to the church as he does to the husband and the wife so frequently right, within the scriptures. Right. Not submitting to typology can be disastrous. <coughs> okay, the woman as created 
And as God created her is a picture of the church which has the law on the inside. The covering is her, or, or the covering of her submission to that law is the reflection or the portion of the outside. And the glory and the presence of God dwelling over around it in the midst of her. It's just an awesome picture. Until, until you forfeit the covering. <coughs> the, Protection, however, like I mentioned momentarily ago, is not for her only. But the protection that uh, she has because of her covering extends well beyond just the parameter of herself. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 10, with all of the mystery, indicates to us that what, wherever the glory was, the cherubims were as well. Verses 18 and 19 of that particular chapter Say, when the glory of the Lord departed from the house or from the temple, the cherubim would lift up their wings and depart also. They were committed to the glory. Now, the Bible declares that we are the temple of God. Yes, that's right. Okay? We are the temple of God. We are the place of the Holy Ghost. We were purchased, correct? Amen. Amen. And we are not our own, the Bible says. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is the place that he has chosen for the glory to reside as long as our submission and the place in creation, uh, uh, the order of authority is being fulfilled and submitted to. Now, as this comes, when a woman cuts her hair, she severs the glory of God from her life. Mm-hmm. How much does she have to cut to do that? Anything. Anything. Because remember that we discussed it. Long hair meant what? Uncut. Uncut hair. Okay, so she severs the glory of God from her life. At that moment in time, if she severed the glory, what else happens? The angels then lift up and depart as well. And so the divine protection of God then leaves as well, which not only leaves her alone, but also as they have been protection for her family, they are also absent from the protection there as well. The importance of a, a woman in the home for godly protection is, is enormous. Uh, there's another passage of Scripture uh, for instance, the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, it, it doesn't relate to us anything for the backside. We've got the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, our loins girt about with truth, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the shield of faith. We don't have any specific piece of armor for our back. Correct? Mm -hmm. It's absent. And... Though I'd like to think that we may never turn and run from Satan, exposing our back, the Bible talks about all the time how people of God have been ambushed. Right. Which necessitates that they are being attacked from the side and behind where they are not expecting it, correct? Right. And so to think that God would leave us exposed when we could easily be attacked from that area would be somewhat strange. But God didn't leave us without protection for our backs. Isaiah 58 verse 8 says that the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. That means Back. behind, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Titus chapter 2 verse 5. I expect everybody to jump up and go, woohoo, yay. But nobody moved. Everybody's looking at me like, so what does that mean? Titus 2 and 5 says that the women are to be keeper, chaste keepers of the home. Amen. I don't want to leave the word chaste now. Chaste keepers of the home. Now, a lot of times that gets extrapolated and boiled down to the fact that you cook, you clean the dishes, you vacuum the floors, you do the laundry, and you keep the beds clean, and that's good and fine and dandy, right? And every lady in the house loves that? Amen. All right. Just one. It's a shame in the house today. 
But the phrase chase keepers of the home has a much more significant and deeper meaning yes. than simply housekeeper. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Now, I don't want to diminish the fact that it does mean housekeeping. Amen. Preach it. So for all you little ladies growing up within the church, when Mama says it's time to do this, don't shirk that responsibility because you want to learn to be a chaste keeper of the home. That's right. Now, I'm really getting funky looks from people in the church. Preach it. But it has a much more significant meaning. It also means that you are learning to be a guard. To beware. That's what they keep it. Mm -hmm. Your job description involves so much more than housekeeping. Right. You are to be the guard that will beware of any evil that tries to come into your house. Right. Oh, the protection that is provided by the covering cherub at the house. That's right. Simply because we have submitted ourselves oh, to God yeah. and to holiness. Hallelujah. Through our uncut hair. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. We can actually open our homes to evil spirits to come and have residence. You're right about that. When we rebel. Right. And sow seeds of rebellion. That's your uncut right. hair not only brings protection to you, but to your entire family. And as we get together as the family of God and within the church. Uh, ladies that are adhering to and, and, and living for truth and holiness with their uncut hair, they bring protection to the church body. Mm -hmm. Think of that. Mm -hmm. There's a story related about a young minister and his wife from the Dominican Republic. Uh, it says her husband was a very promising young man within Bible school. He was quite a preacher, and the uh, lady and husband who were teaching there at the Bible school to them uh, consistently taught on the concepts and uh, purpose of holiness within the Bible school and throughout the works that were being done there in the Dominican Republic. This particular woman had long hair, but she persisted in trimming it all the time, and uh, even though she was taught, don't cut it, don't trim it, hey, this is not right, don't do this, it's wrong, it's going to cost you more than you could ever imagine. She was negligent about listening to those things, and seeds of rebellion were sown within her, and she continued to walk over the Holy Ghost and walk over the teachings of truth and holiness, and she continued to trim her hair. What she did not understand was that she opened her home for an invasion from the enemy. Okay? She opened her home from spiritual uh, wickedness to come in because now she had lifted up and the glory was gone. And as the glory was gone, the angels also departed. Correct? Uh -huh. It wasn't very long that through her disobedience, this is exactly what happened. And her husband though a great preacher, fell into adultery with a girl just down the street in their neighborhood. Their lives were shattered. Their ministry was completely ruined, all because somebody did not want to take the teachings of holiness and love it. Just cutting a little bit. Just, just trimming a little bit. I like long hair, but I just want it I need it to grow, so I have to cut it to make it grow. Remember we talked about this, how long is long? Yep. That million dollar question over and over again. See, there's something that causes us to use those excuses when we fully understand and have heard the teaching that the glory will depart, the angels will leave, and we are bringing in spiritual wickedness by the simple action of that rebellion. And my friends, it's pride, it's vanity, which lays the foundation for that rebellion to come in, all because of a small action contrary to the word of God. Proverbs 31, we were just talking about it a minute ago, verses 11 and 12, 
The scripture says this. It says that the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Let me ask you this question. Ladies, can your husband's hearts safely trust in you to guard the glory, to be the rear guard? Jesus, hallelujah. And when they leave and leave the house, that they know that whether you're there or not, as the children go off to school in some cases, or to play in the neighborhood with worldly children, that somebody's there that has the rear guard the blood, that godly influence in the home when their presence is not there, ensuring a divine protection upon their family. Husbands, ask yourself the question, does your heart safely trust right. in your wife? Right. Do you have that assurance that says you can trust her? It's an awesome responsibility. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just a house cleaner. If you're looking at it that way, then there's not much glory in that position, is there? But when you look at it as you are the rear guard that God has provided, it's a totally different scenario. And what an awesome responsibility that God has entrusted to you as women in the home. Wives to your husbands and mothers to your children. What confidence he has placed within you. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 28 from where we've been reading. I'll read the NIV version in this particular instance of verse 13. Speaking again. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, emerald. Chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you, cre you were created, they were prepared. Who's it speaking of? Lucifer. It's speaking of Lucifer, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the description that is attributed to him. Gold and jewels bedecked him in every way. It was that way so that he could guard the glory, protect the glory. One of the things that contributed to his vanity was this exact description. All of the jewels, the mountings of gold, all the shininess that it provided became something which gave him the vanity that sowed seeds of his rebellion. It then uses, gives us a clearer understanding or, or certainly helps us to understand or if we had a lack of understanding before to understand why 1 Timothy 2 and 9 and 1 Peter 3 and 3 admonishes us to not adorn ourselves with gold and pearls. Have you ever thought much about that? If you look at the history of you know, Paul's day, pearls were one of the most prized jewels that there was. In fact, uh, it, it, the history tells us that the rich, uh, the affluent, would often have pearls and they would wear one around their neck so that if they were to wake up in the middle of the night or certainly when they woke up in the morning they would be reminded of just how special and affluent they were. What would cause you to do that? Vanity. Oh, that's right. Vanity is whispered from the congregation. Yes, absolutely. Vanity would cause you to do this. Vanity caused Lucifer to become a traitor because of these very things, and so also did it cause men and women throughout time to be vain. And is there any wonder that there are warnings and admonitions within the Scripture that we as children of light should not fall prey to such things as gold and precious stones? Mm -hmm. We have been afforded the privilege of angelic protection, special place in his ministry if we were to indulge in vain desires to wear jewelry what would it cost us? Is our salvation worth a few Egyptian baubles? I mean if you think about it 
Is there any reason that he created streets of gold? <laughs> gates of pearl? Yeah. Hmm? We're going to have all of that in glory. Right. Amen. If we protect the glory here. Amen. Does that make sense to you? Amen. What a comfort it is to know that the angels of the Lord are encamping around and about our families. Diligently on guard against the intrusion of enemy forces. I certainly am never with my, my children 24 hours a day. My wife can't be around them 24 hours a day. There are times and situations that they are going to find themselves in. My children now range from, if I can spit it out, from 10 to 20-something. It means that I'm getting old. <laughs> but it means that they're also in environments that they don't have mom and dad there every moment answering the questions for them, telling them what's best and not best to do, and they have to have an assurance. Mm -hmm. And that assurance is going to come from angels that are encamped about them. Why? Because they have a mama that loves the Lord mm -hmm. and is their rear guard. Yes. And a dad that teaches holiness in the home and a love for the truth of God's word. Amen. There are several stories, several stories that I can relate to you. There are some within the, the confines of the, the book here, and maybe I will take the time to just relate one to you perhaps. But you need to understand that the how these things fit together. Husbands are put on uh, in the lives of these women as a safeguard. Remember, women are so driven by emotion and, and the way that God has created them that the husband is set there as a balance. Amen. A safeguard as the woman begins to carry out the wondrously important duties that God has placed within her hands. He is her support. Mm-hmm. I believe the book of Genesis used the word help me. Amen. And how, how better to see those things in action as a wife provides that protection of the rear guard in the home and the husband, the balance within the home. How greater does that help me never come out and show itself in the lives of a husband and wife and that, than in that respect? Only eternity will really reveal to us how many times our family has been protected by the promise of the power that is resting upon a godly woman's head. There is a story that I guess the Brother Mangus has related about a precious saint of God that claimed this promise at a very desperate time in her life. The story says that the lady's son was in a very serious car accident when he was brought into the emergency room the doctors did not even work on him because they said he was too far gone. They left to go to work on other patients that